time if you're good for time and they're oh, probably good for I'll time totally so it's until they uh, start telling us to shut up or you tell me to cut you off then we'll just kind of roll with this i guess okay okay um well first of all with the drums um what am i doing with the drums here actually one of the things i do just want to point out um i absolutely love the way these racks work now from reason over to record just having um, I think you, you you have unlimited racks. Is that correct? Um, so what I've done is I've actually I've actually got all of my drums over here. So if I just I don't know maybe let's just go and have a look at this kick. Um, I'm subbing all of my drums. I'm just using um, the 14-2 mixer. Actually, I find it quite amusing actually that we 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 have an L, uh, an SSL and we're routing that through a Mac. It looks like a Mackie desk, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> sorry, it's fantastic. I love the desk, but. Uh, the irony wasn't lost on me on that, but um, I think that's, anyway. Uh, so if I just open up some of these, I've got a drum sub here and a parallel compressor, or parallel compression. I'm actually using the uh, the pod actually just to dirty it up a little. Um, probably not rocket science to you guys, but all I'm doing is I'm just sending all of these drums through the 14.2 and taking the output. And what I'm doing is I'm just running that back into a mix channel here. Can you see this okay, Ryan? Is it? I can see it okay. I'll see if everybody else um, agrees with me. It's yeah. it's small because of the resolution, but we're dealing with the mixer tonight, so I think we kind of need to have a, a bit of a we have, yeah, we have to a zoomed of, out we have view. To with it. <laughs> but so, I mean, I, yeah, what we're seeing right now, you've got all of the drum mix channel going to a 14.2. That's acting essentially as a, as a fader group, right? And then yeah, you're... It's a sub. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I'm just taking... Um, I'm also taking a parallel from the spider just into a mix channel um that i'm using for the parallel processing which i'm just using the uh i'm just using the pod for um let's just zip back over maybe to the mixer and just have a little look at this so i'm just gonna solo this just go and have a look through some of these things the kick so this is all um, this is all um analog recorded tracks right that's a yeah, that's actual absolutely bass drum. what i've done is i've unashamedly just brought some stems in here um just to just so we can take a look we're really we're specifically kind of looking at, at at the mixer tonight aren't we sure 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 um so one of the other thing I, I mean it was interesting um one of the things james was talking about with the dynamics the uh the, the ratio full tilt and the release very quick um for me one of the things with drums which I've always kind of turned to is um, is the expander. Um, you know that kind of thing where you get uh, with a hi hat, like a, a limp wristed drummer with the hi hat, where maybe <laughs> it isn't the, the if you like the hi hat doesn't really spit enough. So um, let's just go and have a look at that, so you can see what I'm kind of doing here. Hopefully you can see this. So. If I just take that out, maybe you can get an impression of what I'm doing here. Uh, let's just maybe bring that around, maybe bring the range up a little there. Can you hear, this is, This has always been a great way, I mean, it's it's almost an extension of, of a kind of transient designer, if you like, the expander. The expander, but basically expansion is, it, it takes, uh, unlike compression where you take um, the quietest and the loudest thing, um, and you make it, you make the difference less. The expander's doing the opposite, so it's making it more. So actually, what it's doing here is it's actually making the um, the hi hat a little more, if you like, it's got more of a spit to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, in in non um, descriptive terms, are we talking just about the high end element of it? No, actually, we're just talking about that. It, it, it's a way of kind of bringing some of the aggression back into the hi hat, uh -huh. if you like. For me, I mean, I could, I suppose, I I, I could have, I could have compressed it. Um, but the expander, I've always used the expander as a kind of way of, if you like, um, adding a little more front end to drum sounds. In fact, I think I'm probably doing it on the kick, actually, because I generally do. You know how you kind of get into a force of habit when you mix things and you just, there's right. certain things you do? Yeah, <laughs> I am using it on the kick. That was just where it was looping around, by the way. Yeah, so I'm actually using the expander. Um... What else am I doing here? Let's have a little look. I wonder if you could describe um, to people the expander. I mean, this is like, you know, so many people see uh, labeled on hardware in, in studios. It'll say compressor slash expander. And most of us interact with it as a compressor and not as an expander. Mm -hmm. Can you describe to people what an expander is doing? Yeah, what it's doing, well, as, as I said, it's taking the difference between the quietest part of the sound and the loudest part of the sound. It's actually making it more 
So it's the yeah. opposite of a compressor. Opposite of a compressor. Yeah, absolutely. The confusing thing on the SSL is that it's part of the gate section. But there we go. Um, gotcha. <laughs> I'm, but in this case, I'm using it as an expander. Very interesting. Yeah. I see. Now, I didn't even know that, that you could, could do that with the, uh, with the gate section of the SSL, that that yeah. was where the expander Abs was. Abs absolutely. Very interesting. Absolutely. Um, let's just solo some of these other things. Let's have a little listen. What have we... Yeah, I always like to... Um, the undersnare. Um, one of the things for me with snares, I often hear... Um, hopefully I'm backing up what I'm about to say here. Um, <laughs> probably, probably not, actually. But I'll just do it anyway. Um, I like to... Let's have a little look up here. Yeah. Yeah, let's maybe bring this down a little. The lower mid, maybe... Just make that a little narrower and just add a little more. Whoops, we need to solo that. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't... I mean, some people like quite thin-sounding snares. In, for me, I've always liked them to have a lot of bottom end. Um, so, for me, the whole kind of... Uh, the, the desk EQ is, is really just so, for me, kind of so musical. Um, it almost you can add so much with an SSL with with SSL EQ before it starts to become unpleasant. Um, I don't know if you found that whilst if you guys out there who've been using the record mixer, you found you can actually get away with adding quite a lot here. Huh. Um, let's just have a little look through here. Let's just in fact I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to solo all the drums. Um, just go through and have a look at some of the things I'm doing here. Now overheads. I'm actually not compressing these overheads very much, actually. I probably would. Let's do more of a James trick here. Let's maybe bring up that ratio. Maybe make the release a little quicker. And maybe I'll just copy the dynamics there and paste them. This is a great feature, by the way. I love this. Now I can just paste these features between the channels. Um, let's have a look into that. Yeah. That's happening a bit more than that. Hmm. So all I'm doing is I'm just trying to, with the with the drums, um, the other thing I think, yeah. Also this ambient 57, which I which I've used here as well. I'm also inverting the phase on that. I don't know if you can hear. But it might be a little tricky. Oh, actually, you're listening to everything in mono. But... Yeah, from my end, I can hear. It's kind of you've got. Uh, a, there's it... a little more bottom end there. Yeah. So wait. So you um, and just so I understand, you've got that's the another mic on the snare that's on the underneath side. Yeah, and so you've inverted the phase. Uh, is that because it literally is pointing the opposite direction of the top mic? It was probably in the wrong place at some point in the <laughs> equation. Um, I, I actually forget what I was. I mean, th th the interesting thing here, actually, just a little thing I just want to say about mic about miking up drums, actually, um, because I, I've noticed there's a kind of there's a big kind of tendency to to get into replacing drums, and I mean, I do it, you know, the same as uh, the same as. You know, everybody else doesn't. In fact, I I, I really enjoyed James Bernard's um, little thing with using the using the CV thing with. Uh, in fact, I nearly just added a Kong and thought I'll add something in here. But actually, I only ever add something if I think it really really needs it. And if I I find that if I record something well, nine times out of ten I actually don't need to. And I actually quite like to keep the intrinsic kind of quality of what I have in the kit. If that makes sense. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, it almost goes back to that philosophy you were saying about, you know, engineers of, of in the days of yore that were much more sort of just committal to their yeah, their tracking abs process. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I've got a drum sub here. I'm using the, um, I mean, the E button. Are, are people kind of cool about the way, in fact, there you go, it tells <laughs> no, you. Constant I, cue. Are we so, all cool about no, how I think, I think that the No, I think we could almost do another hour, I think, on the E button. <laughs> <laughs> Depending upon who you ask, what, yeah. what is well, basically this magical think e of it? Uh, think of it as think of it as the lo-fi button. Yeah, it the relates to the top and the bottom. Although actually, I've kind of explored the modelling here a little actually, and it seems there seems to be something going on with the parametric bands as well. Um, but essentially, what my understanding of of the way the the E series used to work was um, the You'd have a kind of, um, if you like, a, a constant cue. So, you, in, in, in other words, you wouldn't be kind of, um, how would I best describe this? 
for me, when I, I remember when I switched over to the G series, I remember my kick drums all sounding so much better because I could actually change. I mean, there is actually a bell button down here where you can change it from a shelf to kind of, you can kind of simulate the way that a parametric band would work. But just being able to narrow the cue and get a lot more, I could turn my kick up louder and I could get a lot more very low end out of it. However, there is, I mean, on the on the drum side here, what I'm actually looking for, I don't know if you can he- guys can hear this actually. Let me just turn, let me take this out. Can you hear a kind of there's a there's a there's a kind of mid rangey thing going on in there as well? Um, it's kind of adding this, if you like, for want of a better word, a kind of lo-fi sort of quality. Yeah, I like that description. I think that's an interesting way. Think of it like the lo-fi button. Yeah, it's just very... think of it as the lo-fi button. That's the way I would always that's think a, of it. That's just. I mean, that's a nice symbol. And you know, as with anything, it's like try and see if it works for what you're doing. You know, we yeah. we don't necessarily have to understand the actual like algorithm that's making that happen, but but we just no. need to. Uh, Try it and see how it works. But that's a kind of nice one-sentence bumper sticker thing. Yeah. E, e button is the lo-fi button. Yeah, and, and and just whilst we're talking about EQ here, you can probably also see, um, I'm, I'm basically, I'm just letting my kick through and the toms through. Um, I've got a lot of high-pass filters popped in there as well. Um, in fact, the parallel compression that I've got over here, if we just go and uh, maybe bring that into the equation... You might be able to, I'm actually running that through a pod as well. But um, I'm also being pretty drastic about, I mean, I, I know James talked about this extensively yesterday, but the whole idea of that, I mean, you can probably see if I just hover over that, uh, kind of 225, and what have we got up here? I'm actually, all I'm, re- act, you know what? I would probably actually be more drastic than that. I told you things, that nothing is ever as a, uh, everything you know is wrong when it comes to mixing. You, I'm, I'm forever kind of, um, so really, all I'm looking for with this parallel compression, I just want, I'm, I'm looking for a kind of mid thing there. I just want to add some excitement to it. Hopefully, I'm also squashing the hell out of it as well. Uh, kind of. The peak will do the trick. Yeah, so, I mean, all I'm doing there is I'm just using the parallel compression just to add some kind of dirt to the drums. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, because of our restriction on time, I'm just going to cancel the solo. Let's just go over and have a little look at the bass. Um, interesting thing with bass um, and kick. I don't know if you guys have ever found this. One of the first things I usually try is, and I bet I haven't done it here, but I'm going to try it right now, is I'm just going to try flipping the phase. Actually, it's better how it was. So that's, um, the reason uh, I'm doing this is you often find, I mean, the whole bottom end. One of the dangers of mixing in solo is you get things individually sounding great, and then you pop them in together, and they just don't work. And it's usually there's usually some phase cancellation going on in there. Um, hmm. So we're just talking about the kick here and the bass. The reason I just tried, I would I would instinctively try this when I'm mixing something is um, because I've got a live kit here. I'm probably not going to flip the phase on the kick um, because it's part of, it's making up part of the drum sound. Um, sometimes the bo- the bottom end just sounds a little more solid by inverting the phase on the bass. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes yeah? that makes sense. Yep. The other thing I'm doing here as well, um, you can also see I'm keying the dynamics. You know what I want to uh, do? I want to actually just... suggest something if we could, uh, Gary. A couple people in the chat are asking for a bit of a zoom in. So I think as we're getting into some of these uh, nitty gritty button and and knob zoom ins, do you think we could switch to the lower resolution to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You'll us find up? I'll be zipping up and down a rack like a madman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we'll get whiplash okay. from the the panning around, but uh, maybe we so can go we... back and forth or something. So what we'll. We we'll... What we need to do. 1024? Yeah, that's the one. But we're going to need to actually um, disconnect our call and then reestablish it. So okay. let's um, let's Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we're live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it will be worth it, honestly. It will yeah, be worth it. It will be worth it. So so everyone's going to stick around. I'm going to sort of hula hoop and try and entertain everyone while we reconnect the call here. So, okay, okay I'll talk to you soon. All right, guys. It uh, doesn't happen on the Oprah show, but uh, good enough. All right. Hey. 
Okay, hey, okay, so now just go ahead and hit your screen share button. And we will... One second. We will await. Yep, turn off my video. All right. Oh, did you turn off... Yeah. Oh, wait a second. I think you turned off your uh, screen share button. Did I? Yeah, go ahead and hit it again. One second. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. Hey, just because I said I could mix. <laughs> right. Okay, go ahead and minimize that Skype window, and I will bring you back in glorious resolution straight out of 1998. Ta-da! Okay, cool. Okay, one second. Let's just get back in the record. Good. Wow. Hey. Hey, look at that. There we go. There we go. Um, bass. Yeah, I was just going to raise this point here with the bass. Yeah, sorry, guys. I'm going to be zipping up and down now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm also, if we just play, you can probably see I'm actually keying the bass uh, from the kick. I'll just zip over there just so we can have a little look in the rack so you can see what I'm doing. Luckily, I think... Um, Sorry, my mouse disappeared there for a second. Actually, yeah, they're just beside each other. I have a bass rack, and I have... Do you know what? I would love to be able to name racks. I'm probably going to provoke all kinds of hysteria <laughs> now, but name a drum rack and a bass rack. Um, you can probably see I'm keying the... Um, I'm just taking... I'm actually just taking the uh, insert out from the kick drum, and I'm just sending this over here to the bass. Now, the reason I'm doing this... It's because I'm actually ducking. I want to duck the bass. One of the problems you have when we're getting a kick drum and a bass to work together is that they can't both occupy the same kind of space, if you like, uh, which is why you tend to see, I mean, I tend to like my low end in the kick. Some people like their low end in the bass. So I don't know if I EQ the kick at 50 hertz or if I'm adding 50 hertz, then I'm probably going to be adding 100 or something um, on the bass. Let me just have a look and see what I'm doing here. Please be consistent, Gary. Look at that. Actually, it's nearly 200, but there we go. Um, so the key thing there is that the, those two can't work. Uh, they can't both be kind of um, cutting through if they both have all the energy in the same area. So all I'm doing is I'm just actually ducking the bass there a little so that when you hear the kick, it just allows a little bit of space at the bottom. It You don't get this kind of surge. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense, and it's something that, you know, we're sort of all used to doing uh, in an electronic perspective, you know, the, the classic yeah. sort of side-chained bass with the kick. Um, mm -hmm. But interesting to see that it comes from a very standard sort of rock mixing technique. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really big on the whole kind of side-chaining thing. Um, the bass copy, I've just, all I've done is I've just copied the, you know, I've just uh, duplicated the track. Um, now, it's interesting because one of the things with bass for me is I, I always, I never have a problem with the bottom end. I can always get the bottom end. It's losing the notes. Do you, uh, if there are any bass players out there, you know when you, 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 go from an, you go from an E up to an A, and the E was really booming, and then the A just disappears. Yeah, I mean, yeah. part of that could be to do with the, there may be a standing wave in your room or something like that, but... Um, losing the note is a big, big problem for bass. Um, so one of the things which I've done here, actually, is I've actually added scream. And I'm just using the tape here, and all I'm doing is I'm just... In fact, I'm doing a couple of things. I'll talk about the, the unison effect I'm, I'm using on this as well. Um, what I'm doing is I'm just... If we just go back up to the mixer, sorry, one second. I just want you to see the EQ, I mean, pretty drastic. CQ. Once again, my uh, my friends, the filters. Is it okay for me to talk whilst I'm playing this? You can still I, hear what I'm doing. I can hear that. If I if I right. see the okay. chat light up with people saying yeah. what what, yeah. then we'll <laughs> we'll deal with it. Okay, so I'm being quite drastic once again with the EQ because I don't need the bottom end from this. All I want is I just want the note. Um, and something which I was used to do in the studio is I was used to use a Roland Dimension D, and the Unison or the uh, UN16 really reminds me of that kind of thing. And uh, I'm just using a little of that on the bass. But the key thing here is I'm using it on the copy. I'm not using it on the main bass. So last thing, I mean, for me, I'm quite pernickety about things being in the middle of my mix. Hmm. Um, namely, the things that kind of need, need to nail, if you like, the, the center of the mix, the kick, the snare 
the vocal and the bass. Uh, I mean, I know there are exceptions. I know there are. Uh, I'm being a little kind of purist in that sense, but um, I like to have the center quite solid in my mix. Hmm. So I'm, even though I'm adding this chorusy effect to the bass, uh, just to be clear, I'm I'm actually adding that to the copy, okay? Which I've EQ'd. A, a quick uh, off-topic uh, question that kind of flew by the screen at one point. Jay Foster Music is asking, I see that the master fader is set to peak. Do you always set it to peak, and why? <laughs> is it? <laughs> um, yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> I do. Um, it's, it's actually, it's not something which I tend to... I, I haven't. I have to confess, I haven't really analysed it in here. So actually, he's kind of caught me um, off my guard here. But um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Why am but, I you know, it reminds me of um, another. There was another question actually that, uh, and, and you, you and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, <laughs> someone had asked a question about tips on uh, overloading and how how not to overload. And you were talking about the gain structure of the master yeah. fader. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could uh, explain that to people. Well, all I'm all I'm to. All I was referring to when we when we spoke about it the other day was um, just allow it. It's once again it's this headroom thing because people people just forget that working in the box. It's you know for me I I've kind of got my my analog head on if you like and I'm just thinking um, I need to allow somewhere to go with the mix. So if I want to maybe add um, I mean there's this there's this whole loudness war thing isn't there that's that that that, that goes on um, and for me. Uh, call me old-fashioned. I still listen to Dark Side of the Moon. Um, I like dynamics in music. I mean, I'm fully aware that in the whole kind of dance genre, is it's is, is quite a different thing. I, I, I've actually done quite a lot of that mixing myself. But for me, um, I like to just allow somewhere to go at the end of the mix if I need to go and add something. Like um, Pef's fantastic combinator. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, middle and side combinator. Right. I'm actually not using it, sorry, on this, but uh, there we go. Um, so yeah, it's 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 just in terms of you know just allowing uh, just allowing somewhere to go. Does that make sense? It does. It does absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So bass. Uh, you, you know what? This is going to get. I'm going to have guys in the chat room. They're going to look at bass intro underscore bip. They'll know straight away which door that came from. Sorry about that, guys. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> guitars. Let's just whip out. I'm not, not really doing anything that fancy on the guitars. Other than I am using... Some of you may have noticed that on Send 7, we have Kong. And what, I, what am I doing there? I'm actually... Do you know what? I absolutely adore these. Let's just flip over to the rack one second. Um, I absolutely adore these... Um, sounds in Kong. The little the effects modules? Yeah, I'm using the tape echo. Oh, it is so cool. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I won't sit here and go, please bring this out of Kong. Please let me <laughs> have this as a device because I'll once again provoke a riot. But, um, you know what? All of these plugins in here, there's some fantastic um, just some fantastic little plugs in here. Uh, Transient Shaper, mm. use it all the time. Ring Modulator. Anyway, do you ever do you ever find yourself using the rattler on on analog snares to uh, sort of? Well, actually, I guess you can't in the on the analog side of things. That's a the rattler or something that's over on the other side. Don't, but have used it. Actually, have used it on uh, on a snare drum. Once again, just going through Kong like I'm like I'm doing here. Um, but uh, gotcha. Great little plugs in there. Um. So where are we on the guitar? Back to the guitars. I'm just gonna cancel these solos let's just go through here and have a little look at what else is going on in here actually I, i'm gonna i'm gonna just move on to the vocal actually because there's a few things i just yeah. want to talk about with effects um cool let's just have a listen see if the vocal I wanna dance. okay a lot of effects wow did i put all those effects on there um just want to talk a little bit about some of you may have noticed, I've actually got a mix channel set up here with a delay um if we just zip over to the rack uh, just open that up. You'll probably see I've actually got a delay with all the feedback turned down. And the reason that I've done that is I've actually, one of the things which I really like to do with delays is I really like to feed them back on themselves rather than have, I mean, you know, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't just put the repeats on the, on the delay themselves. But one of the things which I really like doing is to actually feed the delay 
back into itself. And one of the things, one of the advantages of that is you can see on the EQ here, I'm kind of taking out 3 dB around 4.5K. I'm adding uh, at about 2K. Now, why the hell am I doing that? One of the things, one of the problems in a mix is effects tend to sound quite static. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. And what I'm trying to do here is I, I every time every time the delay goes back round the chain, it gets re queued. So in other words, every time it goes round the chain, another three dB of the four point six hertz or whatever it is, and I'm adding some of this. I'm also um, am I. No, I'm not using the filter, actually. Probably would do. Maybe just put that down there. But this is something that is sort yeah. of referred to as a, a true analog delay. Yeah. At, at least in, in modern terms. I mean, is it just something that's always been done? Yeah. I mean, there's actually, weirdly enough, there's two ways of doing this, actually. There's the way that I'm I'm just sending this um, from, where are we? Send, uh, send 8, actually. And you can see that I've also got... Um, send a also selected on the actual delay channel of width so you can see that i'm feeding it back another way of doing this actually is quite often um you may have heard about parallel um treatment of i don't know usually a lead vocal for me one of the things which i quite often do is i i maybe want to take a big problem is s's um in delays and reverbs they drive me crazy um, too many George Michael records. Um, man, does he need a de-esser or what? But there we go. <laughs> <coughs> um, and a, a big problem there is that um, quite often doing this technique that I'm showing you here doesn't work. So what I'll do is I'll actually copy the vocal and I'll actually EQ it just to suit the effects. Does that make sense? So yeah. as I might take all the top end out, I'll certainly try and remove the S's. So in other words, I'm sending, if you like, it's like a parallel send. Hmm. Um, and I'm not interested in the direct sound. All I want is the effects. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and connected very much with this, actually, on the lead vocal. Send 5 is going to, well, I hope it's going to... Um, a reverb. We hope so. Yeah, let's go over here and have a little look. Um, one of the things I'm doing on the reverb here, um, if we can find it. Sorry, I'm because of the resolution, I'm going to be zipping around this rack a little. Let's go and find it. It's over here. Yeah. So the big reverb that I've got on the vocal, I've got a compressor. I'm just using it on the return, by the way, in the desk. Um, I'm actually side-chaining I've actually got a compressor after the reverb, and I'm side-chaining the compressor from the vocal. So whenever the vocalist is, or whenever the singer is singing, I'm kind of ducking the reverb. Does that make sense? So that yeah. um, if you like the the dry signal there is, it's a little, um, it's a little less affected. I mean, you can That's, well, that's very cool that's because that's, to... you know, the like amateur mixing 101 for, for young Ryan was um, putting far too much reverb on things. And it's because you want that reverb there on the on the tail mm -hmm. and you can't. But it just takes over if you if you don't. I, di I did not know that that was uh, the way to do it. But that's very well, it's, cool. It's, it's one of the ways of doing it. I mean, when I when I'm mixing, I I. I never see effects as being separate from instruments in a mix. I. I mean, the way that I would tend to mix is I would probably bring all of my effects back up on channels, actually, uh, on mix channels. Um, if I'd had maybe a little more time to prepare this, I probably would have brought them back up there. Um, it just allows me more control. I mean, there's nothing wrong with using the effects returns over here. But it, does that make sense? It just means yeah. I can EQ those because effects take up so much space in mixes. And how many times have you mixed something and it just suddenly starts to sound like a mush. And then you meet the effects. <laughs> that would be every returns. time I mix something, uh, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's quite often for me as well. But um, so I'll mute the effects and listen back to it, and I'll be shocked. I think, wow, it sounds fantastic. I mean, there is a sort of a, hey, maybe there's a message in there. Don't use so many. Um, one of the things I found with reverb, actually, and I'm really not kind of backing up what I'm showing here on the screen is that I try to get maybe two max three reverbs um, to work for a whole track. The more reverb, the more different types of reverb you start to add, 
the more likely you're going to run into a mush. Um, and the reason I mention this is because, um, you know, with, with regard to combinators, uh, it's very, very easy to kind of just almost through force of habit start adding loads of reverb to mm. air, or, or to add individual reverbs to channels. I mean, actually, right. the, one of the great things about recorders, it almost... Um, it almost isn't conducive to working that way. There are other... Do- Actually, I'm just going to say it. Logic. I mean, just reverbs on inserts, you know, with adjustments of dry and wet settings. So you, I look at some people's, you know, actually some of the, even the demos that go out with Logic, and there must be 20, 25 reverbs on inserts. And I'm thinking, how can you possibly get any separation? <laughs> right. Sorry, I'm being... I'm, I'm in, and just, I'm, you know, from a from a, a studio guy as you are, it's like... You know, going into a studio, if they had twenty uh, Lexicon four ADLs or something in the room, it would just be madness. But uh, you know, I think it's interesting. It sort of forces you to, to uh, if you're working with the auxes, it's it's approaching mixing on an analog style desk in an analog style way will yeah. yield an analog style result, and that's yeah. the great debate that we all have about oh, does digital sound better than analog? And da, 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 mm. da. some of it's the methodology, and yeah. the methodology yields the result that you want. So I think that's a kind of a cool way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I have to say um, here, just a, a point that um, I think Ernst made about the the RV seven thousand, it really I cannot state enough how great that reverb is for me the criteria of a great reverb is um a lot of plug-in reverbs they sound like they sit on top of a mix does that make sense um whereas for me the great thing about a 480 um 224 is they became part of the sound and ironically i wouldn't have to eq them as much because they sounded like they became embedded in the sound and for me, I get that whole thing with the RV7000. It's, it's, it's such a great reverb. It really is. Mm. It doesn't sound like it kind of floats on the top. Does, does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Because of time, I'm going to move a little quicker <laughs> okay. over here. Um, actually, let's just talk a little bit about the master section. I want to talk about the bus compressor. Yes, let's um, do. Now, you remember I mentioned to you, um, let's just see what I'm listening to, first of all. <laughs> on a loop by the way in case you're thinking wow this track is so dull now um <laughs> so a little bit about the bus compressor um i'm using a ratio of two to one i'm using quite a fast attack now the key thing with the fart you won't get away with the fast attack like that if you are banging if that needle is is kind of up there you know eight twelve db of game reduction it just it isn't going to happen um, this sort of goes one, counter to our um you know the slamming the meters like how many times have we heard oh yeah i'm just pinning the meters and like that's kind of yeah. a cool guy thing but this is yeah this is definitely something that is meant for the subtlety you need to uh, for me i've always mixed into this i don't add it later um i, I know i'm going to get lambasted for that kind of whole uh maybe that ethos because some people don't use it that way um the problem, what I'm trying to avoid is this. If I just take out the side chain just for one second, just watch the needle now. Can you see how the needle is just, the kick is completely dictating what the bus compressor is doing. Yeah. So I, I'm left with two choices. I either turn the kick down or I re cue the kick. Um, I don't want to do that because I like a lot of very kind of low. I like a lot of sort of 50, 60 hertz on a kick. I like to feel it kind of um, move some air for want of a better expression. So let's go and have a little look at this. If we just zip over to the rack again. I have to say James Bernard seems um, shocked uh, that you mix with the uh, with the bus compressor on. Oh, well, from from the beginning? Yeah, starting the mix. Yeah, absolutely. He, he I've always, even put yeah, his actually, cap locks yeah, on. So, sorry, I'm sorry to contradict you there, James. Actually, because I I was watching, and one of the things I want to, you know, what there's more BS when it comes to mixing than probably anything else. <laughs> um, it's the way that I've learned to do it, and the way that works for me. It isn't the gospel, according to yeah, right. Gary. You know what I'm saying? Um, it works for me. Um, I have found that if I put it on later what will happen is that my balance will change yeah right okay so i'm if you like i'm mixing into it but yeah it's it's completely open for discussion all of these things um so you can see the side chain what have we got here 
uh, mastering EQ. So if we just go down here. Actually, let me just... Yeah, so that isn't the EQ. That doesn't look like the EQ. I think it's this one. That's the one. There we go. And you can see that I've also got a spider there. Let's just flip those around a second. Wow. Let's hit K, get rid of some cables. Um, you can see what I'm doing is I'm just running out the mix. Um, I've actually got I've actually got the mix coming going to off to various places there. I've actually got it going um just the I've actually got it going off to the just just out to the so we're we're monitoring it if you like out to the sound card here. I've also got it going off to the EQ. Now the EQ is then being returned to the side chain of the compressor. I've also got this going off to the vocoder, so I've got my little spectrum analyzer. Um, so this is quite a drastic EQ, isn't it? I mean, taking out a lot of bottom, I'm taking out quite a lot of mid as well because the yeah. mid was dictating the way the compressor was behaving. But this is a this is I, I love this because this is such a classic example of mixing with your eyes first mixing with your ears. If you <laughs> look at it, you might go like, "Wow, haha, that can, we can't do that. That's horrible." Yeah. But yeah. you probably, I'm just going to guess, didn't hardly even look at the picture. Uh, before you, you know, it was done and set up the way you wanted it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I knew that I would have to side chain it as soon as as soon as the kick started to dictate what the bus compressor was doing. I knew, right? I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to curb that. Yeah. Right. Right. Can I also give another little feature a plug here? How come nobody has ever done this before? Put a control room output. I love this. This is so hmm. good. And what it means is, of course, if you've got a band in there, that I can straight away just go and monitor. I don't know. I can kind of flick that over to the send and listen. I don't know. I can't can't use A because I've actually got a delay on there. But you get the idea. So setting up Q mixes for musicians is so easy on here. And being able to just monitor those and hear what the musician's hearing. Um, I mean, even just a vocalist. And also having a little pre button here so that if I go and solo the... Because the worst scenario for me is um, the singer will sing something a totally different way if they're not singing against the track. I know that's a really obvious point to make, but um, just me being able to mess around, and, and also singers always want um, their voice way too loud in their cans, um, and I definitely don't want it that loud in the control room. Um, so this is such a cool feature, and having a dim button as well. Fantastic. Um, that was just my little plug there. I just, I just love that. I just think the whole workflow with this, with this mixer is just genius, and I can't believe that nobody's. I mean, maybe that's why this took a little longer to, to kind of. Uh, they uh, maybe propellers were looking at this for a long time and just thinking, how, how can this be done? Uh, they always do things in a different way, which I, which I just love. Um, they haven't kind of, you know copied what anybody else is doing i just even even down to the way that the um i don't know i don't know what the technical term for the, the these these I'm, I'm actually bypassing the master inserts here but just these just being able to assign buttons um to the inserts just go to buttons i mean this is this is just mm. sort of genius for me huh yeah it really is good yeah. and being able to change the order of you know being able to put the eq before the dynamics and actually for me the insert first before the dynamics and EQ. In fact, I did toy with the idea of, um, I thought, I wonder what it would be like if I just put Scream on the insert hmm. on the tape setting of every single channel in my mix uh -huh. and put the insert first so that I can kind of get that kind of mojo tape kind of compression thing so you, anyway i'm i'm sure I've, i'm sure i've talked way too much today <laughs> no, no no we we love it we love it yeah um well, well maybe maybe what we should do is is maybe take some questions at this point yeah let's do that you yeah. want to you want to flip back to the uh, the camera feed and yeah okay absolutely i mean hopefully i've probably glossed over. there's other thing i was as i said there was the there was the kind of matrix sequencer uh, um just doing the auto panning with the with the nord sound i've got in here but to be honest with you i watched pef's presentation of that and i just thought you know what that's embarrassing you know maybe <laughs> if just just looking at what i'm doing i'd be embarrassed <laughs> Right. Yeah, wait, so wait till I do my CV uh, live session. Then, then everyone will feel much better about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, all right, cool. Um, so let's yeah. uh, go ahead and hit your uh, video button to disable the screen share, and then you're going to hit your video button again to enable your camera. Okay. And guys, while uh, while this is happening, go ahead and send in your final questions, and we'll just throw everything at Gary and let him uh, give us his his answers. Nervous breakdown. <laughs> right? Okay, cool. Back with you, Gary. 
So uh, a couple of questions coming in here. Um, here's here's a question from Right Tracks. He wants to know, uh, it, will you will you be doing a mixing in record DVD? I would be delighted to. <laughs> I'd be delighted to. If the, is that um, a, is that an offer, Right Tracks, or is that yeah, a, yeah. a there's a there's a um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of no secret over here in the UK that I've I've been out with with uh, Matthias last week, and he's kind of been doing the the Reason Five stuff, and I've been doing the Record stuff, and I'm I'm kind of so enthusiastic about all of this that I really want to kind of get this message out about just how good the sound of this um, this desk is. So yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to do anything to anything to kind of I can't say enough good things about it. So hmm. yeah. Emotica wants to know: Do you use? Do you still use reference tracks to A B mm. to your mix? <laughs> I think. You know, I had, do I understand we, the question? If we right? had three hours to talk today. There was Is all this, these different things. Are we um, talking about the the? Uh, just so I understand the question correctly, are we talking about that moment where you're working on a track or a mix, and then you put on somebody else's track, and all of a sudden you feel a lot less? Uh, at least for me, I'm speaking about me. Yeah. You feel uh, like, oh, this is oh, this sounds so much better. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I always, I mean, if I'm mixing a track and I want something to be like, yeah, a kind of a killer's track, I, I should also, I haven't even talked about kind of, I haven't imposed on anyone my tastes in music, actually, because I should, I don't want to give this impression that I'm just a, a kind of rock person. I mean, I um, I have this knack in my career of when things are going really well, I, I uncreate it and go and do something completely different. And weirdly enough, up until probably around about 98 maybe i'd always done guitar pop that kind of thing and i decided to completely uncreate everything and i i got into the whole two-step thing um and i had a couple of really big hits here in the uk with um uh, a track called summer of love and also the night crawlers push the feeling on and i did it on an mpc and i used a mackie desk to mix it because i decided i needed to kind of go sort of the other way so you know i'm I'm very much, I, I listen to everything. I mean, I suppose if I were to put my finger on an album that for me sums up everything, I, it was probably Kid A by Radiohead in that I love, I've always kind of loved electronic a la sort of craft work and maybe Aphex Twin, uh, just combined with the whole, I'm, I'm a bit of a prog head as well. I, as I said, I, I unashamedly confess to loving Pink Floyd. So I suppose craft work meets Pink Floyd is my... <laughs> That might be the weirdest musical Venn diagram uh, I've, yeah, uh, I've we heard go. of recently. Mm. Um, all right. Uh, there, was, there was a question that came in from Navaretliv, uh, which was, do you, this, I don't know if he's speaking from his past experience or what, but he says, do you, do you notice a difference between what's playing live out of uh, Reason versus the rendered song when you actually export the final song? No, uh I don't, and in fact, it's weird that this should be mentioned because I these were these were this was one of those questions which I thought I need to explore this, and no, I don't. Um, I suppose I could put a question back. Do, does he? <laughs> I don't. I don't. <laughs> right. A, a question from Michael Orr. He wants to know uh, where do you see Reason and Record going in the future, and where would you, where do you want to see it go? <sighs> wow. Um, well, this is, I, I, I'm I'm sure I'm not going to bore everyone with it. Uh, for me, I would love to see some subgrouping on the mixer. Um, I mean, it was easy. Yeah. I mean, if we were in another door, we'd be completely stumped. We really wouldn't be. I mean, because of the flexibility and the cabling and the way the rack works, I was able to send all of those drums to 14.2 mixer. I would love some kind of subgrouping. I'd also like to be able to um, group tracks and clips i i like to be able to work with 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 groups of things i i don't know i mean that's um i i, I would i don't know it's I, I would love as i mentioned to you about the screen thing i mean i think i love the sound of scream i don't know whether there's any way that some kind of um if you like take emulation on on that channel because i mean when the when the eq is bypassed and the dynamics are bypassed if i'm if if, if i'm correct here that that signal is is it's not colored. It's That's basic. right. With, with, with no EQ, no dynamics, it's just a straight pass of the audio. Yeah, yeah. and maybe the, there could be um, an option. I mean, there's, there's always tiny little thing. And I mean, the way uh, when I was sending all of those drums to, uh, to a sub today, I would have liked to have been able to solo safe. Do you know what I mean by solo safe? 
No. Oh, and, but no. <laughs> so the, the drum group was 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 it was always soloed, or at least an option to have it was because it meant that I had to go and solo uh-huh. the 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 mix channel. Somebody's going to come on now and go. Actually, Gary, if you do it this way, then <laughs> yes, it, yes, it does. Just because I'm so excited. It, it, it's almost like if you, if I if I wasn't passionate about it, if I didn't care, then I then I'd be like, oh well, well, this is the way it is. But because I think it is so good, I'm actually thinking to myself, right now, what other little things would I, you know, I, I mean, I I would like to be able to to throw kind of, um, you know, just with the eight sends we've got there, I'd like to be able to just send stuff off of one fader to another effect or something like to it to another device and I, I already mentioned to you i mean the 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 effects in kong are just so good i would dearly love to see those available as, as sure. you know as devices and maybe just the final thing maybe some delay compensation would be nice because actually it's so good i actually thought i've got to thinking hey can i bring hardware into the equation here right right so yeah. rukafest uh, is asking a question um are, is, are you now using uh, the this this mixer to mix projects in actual yeah, commercial uh, projects. Yeah, abso- absolutely. In fact, I'm actually bringing stuff in from uh, stuff which I've started in Pro Tools and 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 Logic. It really does sound that good. It sounds so much better. Um, That's something that so, James said yeah. last night as well. James from yeah. the Freemasons. Mm. Mm. Oh yeah, I mean we I, uh, James covered the tempo thing, but the tempo thing is is just ridiculous. It is. I actually just can't but you know all of those times when you you did a track and you wanted the prog rock <laughs> yeah I mean not that you need an ending like that but yeah <laughs> it's just so doable we can't how have many to, how many times just, have we spent just I've probably spent days trying to program that and get it absolutely right um Right. So, yeah, the tempo thing. I mean, it's it's just fantastic, and I'm sure, you know, there's 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 scope there. I mean, you know, with Neptune, we're 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 doing pitch and the all the audio being just being completely elastic. I I love the way that um, it's almost like tempo is it's it's like irrelevant if you, (laughs) which I, I just love that whole that whole concept. I don't need to think about that anymore. Right. A a question from Emotica. Um. How you're feeling about some of the other uh, plugin emulators that are out there that do uh, some of the very cover a lot of the same similar ground in terms of emulating this type of channel strip signal flow? Mm-hmm. Do they do, do they do an okay job? I mean, I, the, it, the answer is kind of implied in the fact that you're you're mixing in here and, and not in using mm-hmm. those emulator plugins, but. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things actually, oh, I can't flip back, but you're, everyone's going to have to take my word for it on here. Um, on the vocal, actually, weirdly enough, uh, I didn't mention this. I'm using, um, I've actually got Podfarm um, Platinum. I'm, I've actually just got an iLock key in here. And I'm actually using some of the models <laughs> in Podfarm. I've actually got a vocal chain, which I set up, which uses a, a Neve preamp into an LA2 kind of model. Huh. So um, I, I wasn't sure whether to go there on that because I know we always get this whole third-party thing, you know, which is kind of boring. And we all know why we don't do that because, you know, stability issues and, and just the whole thing, the integration with the rack and everything is just seamless. But, yeah, I, I, I have been kind of messing with the whole Line 6 thing there. Gotcha. A question from Greg Hobgood. He wants to know about mastering. Do you master inside record or do you uh, master... Do you master at all, or is it? Do you send that off for the mastering engineer to do? It depends, actually. I mean, these days, uh, hey, budgets are just either small or zero in many cases. So I quite often, quite often do it myself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend. What I would tend to do, I, I've always. This is probably me being a little old-fashioned here. In that, I tend to see mastering as a. I like to think of it separately. Uh, I don't add that chain if if that's what. Um, is being referred to here. Okay. I don't have that on the mix. I like to mix it and then think about the, you know, the whole mastering thing. Um, the only other, am, am I allowed to plug anything else here? Probably not. Am no, I? I, yeah, look, I, you, I, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, there's a Slate digital plugin which I've been messing around with as well. This FGX. I don't know if anyone's messed around with that. That's, that's also great. Right. Um, but hey. I didn't have um, Pef's Combinator then, did I? So <laughs> we'll, it will never be the same again. Gotcha. Um, 
Okay, well, <laughs> I think we're going to make this the, the final question because it's probably the most profound and important question of the evening. <laughs> R. Giuliano wants to know, the Beatles or the Monkees? Wow, man. You didn't throw the Beach Boys in there as well. <laughs> um, that, that almost would be a It would have debating. to be the Beatles, but that's not dissing the Monkees in any way. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The monkeys, uh, they don't get yeah. enough cred as uh, shapers of our modern culture. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. Well, listen, Gary, I just, uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you so much. You really have sort of uh, toughed it out with us here for nearly two hours of hardcore mixing th- uh, theology, practically. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just, I, I can't thank you enough. It was a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And, you know, you. you dropped some serious little... There's, I'm going to rewatch this one myself. There's a couple ones where I just thought, well, that's a simple one-sentence way to look at this massive <laughs> topic. So uh, I think those are great. And everyone just get a get a yellow notebook paper out and just jot those down, if, I, I guarantee if you. If anyone wants to tweet me, it's just, um, just twitter.com slash Gary Bromham. All right. Gary yeah. Bromham. So if anybody wants to... if any, Because um, I'm sure I'll watch it back and I'll go... Uh, you bluffer, Gary. <laughs> I told you this is, I mean, it's like the point that James made. It's a very important point. Um, I don't want to kind of impose, I, I've learned a, a style of mixing that works for me, but it just, it's, it's the way that it works for me. I'm not saying that it's the only way to mix. Yeah. Sure. sure. I want to be quite clear about that, actually. The answer is that there is no answer, but at the same time, you know, being able to watch a, a true professional who has honed his craft over years and years, you know, it's like there's no one way to, to tune up a, a Corvette, but if mm. you're into wanting to learn to do that, it would sure would help to watch someone who sure knows what he's doing to do that, you know. Yeah. So yeah. so I, I just, I appreciate it so much. I'm, this is going to be my, uh, when I go to start mixing my next project, I'm going to rewatch this one uh, probably a third time, maybe about a fifth time by that point, who knows. <laughs> so I'm flattered. <laughs> thank you so much, Gary. <laughs> And, Pleasure. Uh, Thanks, guys. Have a good night. And you. All right. Take care. Take care. So, uh, listen, guys, that does it for us tonight. And uh, we will be back. So, tomorrow, well, actually, maybe we won't be back. Uh, this sort of uh, brings us to this song. Hopefully we're back. If we're if, if the world hasn't ended, we'll be here on Monday with Kim Neva. She's from Engine House Music, and she is a specialist in dealing with film and TV syncs. And she's going to kind of tell you how to get your music into film and TV uh, or onto video games and stuff, because that's where the money is uh, these days. So that's, that's the game now. So, uh, I hope we all see you. Oh, my God, the, the <laughs> I swear the, the building alarm just went off. I got to go. <laughs> it may be the end of the world. Who knows? We lived!